This is a really difficult question. Oh, that's a great question. Oh, that's a good question. That is a great question. That's a really good question. I love this question. And I think this really is going to help me kind of meditate and grow on it. Want to hear the answers? Check out season two of New Media Lab with Robert Southgate. New episodes every Tuesday. Available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and wherever you subscribe to your favorite podcasts. everybody this is diane one of the real housewives of alaska and this is marnell and it's movie time it's movie time and i'm it's, pretty sure there the expiration date's just a suggestion it's movie time <laughs> <laughs> jerry was hilarious this episode jerry was awesome jerry was oh. up the pole <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what he was talking about. Like those first two, I was like, what? I know his metaphors. I was like, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little dirty. I'm not <laughs> sure I want to know. Then again, it sounds a little dirty. I totally want to know. <laughs> and it was a little dirty and we totally got to know. Oh my God. He's prolific. Right. Three kids. Uh-huh. Dang. Poor Nabila. <laughs> you know, all the condoms are expired. You can't really take those expiration dates as except as uh what was it that Diane said? A suggestion. Suggestion, suggestion. Yeah. yes. That's yes. very all- true. This far into the apocalypse, they probably are all expired. Nope, it's totally the rhythm method at this point. <laughs> Be checking out books from the library on uh, Egyptian uh, birth control. That is Ancient. hilarious. Actually, it was honey and, and crocodile dung. Uh, I know. You've mentioned that before, and that's disgusting. I'm fascinated by that. Well, you just Ugh. let us all know how that works out. Ugh. Oh, once I get access to a, a live crocodile, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> So we are here to podcast the season Bounty, which I guess Bounty could refer to Jerry's life. <laughs> I actually thought that. I was like, what? when this on my second watch, I was like, well, he's got a bountiful brood. I didn't think that until just now, but boy, it's true. That's funny. So we're at season nine, episode 11. Yes. And I was just saying that I just read that the time on Ezekiel's watch when the episode opened up was 9-11. So there you go. That's so interesting. I did not. I, I watched the show twice now and I have totally phased past it. And I think it's because I really, really am so annoyed by the whole previously on The Walking Dead. <laughs> well, I was watching it, but I didn't freeze frame fast enough to catch the time. So... It was I'm just, really in an article that I found the time. In season nine, why are we doing that all of all of a sudden? It's not like we were doing this. Like we, we talked about this. It's not like none of us knows. Right. It's not like all of us aren't watching week to week or we're binge watching it. We just watched the last episode. So we we're don't pretty need sure to know. We know what happened. Yeah. Right. I mean, unless and I don't think they are. It doesn't seem like they are. Maybe it's because I'm so myopic about the episodes. Um, they're specifically pointing out things they want you to keep in mind while you watch this episode. I guess I'll have to pay attention the next time we watch an episode and see if that's the case. I'll have to try and pay attention to better, better. I've been really trying to ignore the previously on because again, the one that they did with Michonne that wasn't even previously on, but previously in the last six years was so irritating that. Yeah. 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 So what did you, do we have any more about Bounty? 
Um, well, we're not quite at the title yet. We're at our ratings first. So what was your rating? I rated it a 3.9 wads of gum. Uh, you and I were very close this time. I rated it the same as I rated the last episode because they were both kind of middle booky. Mm -hmm. So 3.875 burned out projector bulbs. Oh, good one. I rated it a little higher this episode because of my good. And I kind of have a feeling that our goods are going to be the same or right around the same time. So I think you should probably go first when we do the goods because I always go first and I feel like I'm going to steal your thunder. I kind of have lots of just freeform notes. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's another one of those episodes that was kind of middle booky. So we'll talk for an hour and a half. Right, exactly. Oh. So our numbers, it was up against the Oscars. Right. So that's something for us to keep into perspective when we actually get numbers next week for this week's episode. Last week's episode, and this is really depressing, it was a ratings low for the series. Less viewers than any episode ever, according to an article in Forbes. Yeah, I think we are on a slow grind to the end. Yeah. Oh, you know, God, that's we, just depressing. Well, the end of TWD Prime, I think the Walking Dead universe will shuffle on. Stagger on, lurk on, <laughs> roam on. <laughs> Pun intended. Yes. So the numbers for last week were 4.538 million views. It was beat out by sports ball. Yowza. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and I, I've seen that um, it was even worse this week. Oh, but no, it, really? It was up, up against the Oscars, and the Oscars actually did really, really well for once. It, so That's because everybody wanted to see Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper making eyes at each other. <laughs> well, it had no host, so it was kind of like, what can we expect? <laughs> Where could we go from here? And I just, I don't know who watches the Oscars. I just watch the live tweets. I just look at the summary of the gowns on HuffPo. Oh, that's funny. Uh, I loved, like, uh, the um, Trevor Noah's inside joke. Did you see that? No, I did not. So he was um, presenting the the best movie award, or not best movie or something. He, he was talking about Black Panther, and he was saying something about... Um, in uh, Wakanda, they have a saying, and he said it. And of course, he's from South Africa, and he said it. And it, he said it's like supposed to mean like together we are, you know, better than we are apart or something. Uh -huh. And the actual translation is white people have no idea I'm lying. <laughs> That's hilarious. I loved it. I, I it was like there was a little bit of controversy about it, uh, but I I I totally am in oh on the joke. Oh my god, give the man his joke. That is hilarious. That is clever. And it's not like, you know, it was a secret or anything. Like the translation was on Twitter like after five minutes. So we were all in on the joke. <laughs> At least those of us with a sense of humor. Right? <laughs> And then Melissa McCarthy, yeah, uh, Melissa McCarthy's puppet. Uh, I just, I watch all of the, uh, the, the highlight reels. See, on, I on totally didn't watch any of that. I literally just looked at a thing about the gowns and then like saw the hubbub about Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper making eyes at each other. Oh, right. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's been a thing. Yeah. That uh, song that we all love but are totally sick of hearing. You know, not listening to popular radio and not having seen the movie yet. Haven't heard of it. Heard it. Not sick of it. I already keep seeing people who are redoing it and like nailing it. And, and so I'm like, it's it's done. It's over. Like moving on. And so moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Back to the title. So, Bounty. So, we talked about Jerry. Mm -hmm. What else have you got? Um, Bounty kind of has two meetings. You know, it has the whole 
a like a bountiful harvest mm-hmm. or or uh, you know a bountiful hunting trip like they they had. Um, but it also means to like have a price on your head, right? Which was yeah. totally what I thought of. I was like, oh, Luke and Alden and mm-hmm. and Lydia. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I I took it as both meanings. Mm-hmm. I, um, you know, the there was a side mission to the side mission, and all of the missions were successful. And we not only got um, Luke and Alden back, but we're plus one. You know, uh, the the older couple that lost their kid, right? Uh, they have a new baby, Earl and Tammy. The Earl and Tammy. Yep. Thank you. I was like, the Rhett Butler chick. <laughs> so I like the fact that there was a, a double meaning, a double entendre to the the title, because I think you're right. I think it totally has to do with the bountiful harvest and also with the bounty on people's heads. Right. Definitely. So our writer was Matt Negrete. Negrete. I always say his name wrong, and I always say I say his name wrong. He has written 20 episodes of Walking Dead and three that I either really loved or really want to see again, Slabtown, Consumed, and The Well. <laughs> oh, the Well is in The Well Walker? No, The Well as in where we got introduced to King Ezekiel and the Kingdom. Okay, okay. Yeah. That was a good episode. Yeah, I love that episode. It's the one where Carol and Morgan show up at the kingdom and Carol is like playing her totally innocent. Oh, my God. Look at the king and his tiger self. (laughs) Oh, God. That was so horrible. Yeah, but it was awesome. By the way, I loved her mid-length hair. Thank you. So did I. And so did Victoria Morris. That was one of the pieces of feedback that we got from Victoria Morris on the Facebook page today. Yes, it needs to be that length always. Like I short, think so. Short hair, short haired Carol is awesome. Long haired Carol is a bit too much. Medium, that's your sweet spot. Mm-hmm. I actually was kind of fooled and didn't realize at first that it was a flashback, and I was like, "Oh, thank God, Carol cut her hair." <laughs> <laughs> Jesus rides up, and you're like, "Nope, this is totally." Yeah, flashback. I was like, "Oh, they're just marking where we are in time." <laughs> yep. Exactly. So our director was a woman named Mira Menon, M E N O N, and she has previously directed one episode of Fear the Walking Dead. Wow. This land is your land, which is one of the episodes that happened on the ranch. Um, but she's never directed Walking Dead proper before. This is her first episode directing Walking Dead proper. She has got some awesome credits. Mm-hmm. So, so are you watching The Magicians? Are you the one who's been telling me about that? I love The Magicians. Oh, okay, because she's got this, a bunch of credits for The Magicians. This season isn't that great, but we're still early on in it. So it's still sort of building. It's getting better. But like the the previous seasons, and this is their last season. Ah, um, uh-huh, okay. Yeah, and I think that's due to like all of the actors being like, we kind of want to do our own thing now that we're famous. But Gee, that I, sounds I, kind of I familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Good on them. You know, they have to look out for their own careers. But yeah, so uh, Blood Drive, that was an awesomely terrible, great, uh, like grindhousey type show that was on sci fi for an entire season. Um, I, I, I personally loved it. I, and, but I have like weird taste. So, um, it's not for everybody, but yeah, then fear the walking dead, a show called glow that I want to see. Hmm. Haven't heard of it. Just, I uh-huh. kind of looked through her, her list of stuff and I, I saw that, but I didn't write it down because it was not one that I'd heard of man in the high castle. Uh huh. And the punisher, nice. the punisher, but yeah, fear the walking dead and the walking dead. So she's done quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. She was no stranger to directing when they, when AMC picked her up. 
It looks like her first, or maybe her second, maybe her first was Fear the Walking Dead, but it looks like she also directed Halt and Catch Fire, one episode of that for them. Yeah. Hmm. So hopefully we'll see more of her work. Yeah. Because I, you know, while I kind of rated this as a middle bookie episode, I definitely had way more good than I had bad. Yeah, I don't think it was the directing that made her a good middle bookie episode. Right. I think it was just because we are building towards the conflict with the whispers. Mm -hmm. And toward the season finale. Mm hmm. Which is creeping up on us. I know. This is already episode 11. That means we have seven left. No, not even seven. No. We have, we have like five four? left. Yeah. Five. Okay. Whew. Wow. And then what? I wonder if we're going to plunge right back into fear. I would imagine so. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it really quick. I'm really excited about fear. I think I have convinced one of my coworkers to uh, start back up watching it because I was like, no, no, no. It's just, um, what's her name? Madison. Mad no, Madison's gone. I actually gave someone that pep the pep talk the other night. No, no, no. You just, you have to get to season four. Trust me, get to season four. Yeah. <laughs> And even season three was really good. Yeah. It, it started to be really good. We, we were like, God, this is a completely different show. And, you know, the truth is, even looking back at seasons one and two, there were episodes that I really enjoyed in both of those seasons as well. I just overall, as I said many a time on the podcast, hate watched it and finally yeah. stopped hate watching it in season four. It was a long slog yeah. to season five, which does not have a premiere date on IMDb. Ah, so. I bet you we plunged straight into it. It wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't even shock me if they overlapped it. Like they so, did last time. Yeah. So the Talking Dead would come on an hour later. Yeah. Because uh, last year, uh, season four, episode one premiered April 15th. So Well, because they did the crossover with Morgan. Yep. So and they they won't have as clean a crossover with Dwight, so they don't no. have the excuse to do it the way that they did it last time. But it'll be interesting to see if they do. Right. But they generally do that with season finales and season premieres, I think, because or new shows just to get people to watch them. Um, so Hell on Wheels and Into the Badlands and Preacher and everything have always kind of been sandwiched in between walking dead and talking so yeah but they don't need to do that with fear no they don't but they probably still will yeah who knows we don't know we obviously don't know we're just speculating speculating <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about the featured cast member so uh, there's a couple of regular members that we haven't done, but of course we felt we had to do Samantha Morton, AKA alpha because she's so terrifying as alpha. She was pretty creepy in this episode too. She, like to look at her, she looks alien. Yes. Yeah. And just the look she gave that woman when the baby would not stop crying. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. It's the uh, she can just she can look right through you. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's a really great actress. I didn't recognize her from anything initially, and it's because she's one of those actors that's a total chameleon, she blends into her character. So when I started going through her IMDb page, I didn't realize just how much she was in and how much I have seen her in because. She just, she doesn't stand out as, oh, that's Samantha Morton playing that role. She is the character for me. Um, and I love what uh, Tara had to say on Talking Dead. <laughs> she's like looking through the binocular and she's like, is that one of the precogs from Minority Report? Oh my God, that's hilarious. I completely missed that. Oh, it was so funny because th that's one of the main things right. that I know her from is she was in Minority Report. That um, is hilarious. Right? And I don't even recognize her, recognize her character from Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Uh, I 
like I ha I have to go through her IMDb pictures in order to get a sense of who she is and anything that I have seen her in just because I I don't recognize her because she's such a chameleon. And this is like the fourth time she shaved her head for a role. So she is a total method actor. Um, so the things that I recognize her from that, uh, like by name, just uh, Elizabeth, the golden age. Do you remember that one? Oh, I didn't realize she was in that movie. Right. Okay. So we're on the same page. Um, she played Mary Stewart. And really? Yeah. Yeah. So that was like, she's been acting for a lot longer um, since before that. Her first acting credit is in 1991. And um, Elizabeth, the golden age came out in 2007. So that was the my first recognition. So Elizabeth, the golden age, uh, John Carter, which was not a great movie. Haven't watched it. Not her fault. Husband has, I'm sure. <laughs> right. And then we, she was in a um, TV series called Max and Ruby. And um, it's, it looks like a cartoon because she's the voice in it. So of course I don't recognize her. So one Kinda of the makes... things I read in an Entertainment Weekly article is that this is the first American television series she's been cast for. Oh. That all of her television up to this point in time have been Brit shows. That makes total sense. Another argument for you to get BritBox and watch Band of Gold. Right? <laughs> so, one of the shows that she is in, she's in like 16 episodes, it's called Harlots. Which is on Hulu. Yes. But it's British. Yes. And it is totally on the list. Like, it's in top 10. We've I binge-watched Ride. I binge-watched... Um, Oh, what did I just... Uh, Russian Dolls on Netflix. Oh, I heard that was really good. It is really good. So I binge watched that. And I really, really think Harlots is like... It's really taken up there in, in something that I need to watch. I'm really uh, kind of talking myself back into getting Hulu. <laughs> they lowered their price. <laughs> I know. You've said that. <laughs> that was part of the reason I've kind of talked myself into it. So Harlots looks amazing. So it's like a it looks like a turn of the century brothel in London, I want to say. Brothel owner Margaret Wells, a.k.a. Samantha, struggles to raise her daughters in London during this 18th century. So, yeah, it just it looks amazing. And now that I know that Samantha is in it, it is like top three now. Um. But yeah, so she has been in quite a lot. And now knowing that they're all British, I really need to bite the bullet and get BritBox. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need to bite the bullet and get Hulu. You need to bite the bullet and get BritBox. <laughs> so you know a few things about her. So she is an Oscar nominated actress. She was nominated for her part in Sweet and Lowdown, which was a Woody Allen movie that starred Sean Penn. She was Oscar nominated for a movie called In America, and she actually won a Golden Globe for a movie called Longford. So we have an award winning and award nominated actress on the cast, which is pretty oh. cool. Yeah. Um, the thing that I thought was super interesting is that she had a stroke in 2006. Wow. So she got hit in the head and there was damage to one of her vertebral arteries and she had a stroke as a result of it and had a loss of vision and partial paralysis. Wow. She took 18 months off of acting and spent all of that time in speech and language therapy and physical therapy learning how to walk again. Okay, so watching her on screen, my other half and I, I have been trying to point this out to him, and he's not seeing it. And I don't know if it's just her makeup or now, like, I wonder if it's just a facial feature of hers. It, does it look like she has, like, a swelling of her upper lip? And I don't mean, like, lip injections. I mean, like... No, she you mentioned like, that. Okay, like, it's it's just, it's driving me insane, like... I, I really need to see an interview with her on Talking Dead or something without the alpha makeup now. 
And, you know, knowing that she had a stroke, that's just and and has come back from it. I kind of that makes me even wonder more about, uh, you know, so she's, what she looks like now. She said, and this is a quote, I still have a slight disfluency. Sentences are spaced differently, but I was given a clean bill of health. So I don't know if she's got any residual phys- physical effects from the stroke or not, but I thought it was super interesting you know, and as someone who's had a TBI, I can really relate to that. Yes. And and yeah. really relate to how much it changes your life. I mean, it's just amazing that she is back to what appears to be completely full function after a, an injury like that. Yeah. And, and back to working in what seems to be a job that she loves, mm-hmm. you know, she, she didn't have to give up acting and it's now I really want to see an interview with her because, um, she, she does bring this, there's a slowness about alpha in that she's just, she's not in a hurry to action or anger or and you know that that seems to be kind of the walker way is she's just you know she doesn't fly off the handle uh, you know she slaps her daughter but you know who doesn't want to slap their daughter <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that because i don't have kids <laughs> i saw a very brief interview with her and she does not appear to have any difficulty speaking and she doesn't appear to speak slowly she's in fact she spoke very passionately about becoming an actor and becoming someone who's engaged in, in film. Ugh. So I didn't really see any of the, the disfluency that she talks about. Huh? But it well, was also I- only like a two minute clip on YouTube. So it could be if she gets tired or if she is in a longer interview that it shows up more. Well, and I was going to say, knowing someone who's had a TBI, who is very critical of herself, <laughs> uh, I think you're you're overly critical of yourself because you don't think that you are as good as you were before the TBI. And, you know, most of us would never know the difference. You know, you, I, I think like, there's tr- that's truth for a lot of people who've experienced that kind of injury. Yes, Right. Right. Good for her. Yeah, I thought that wow. was really amazing. So the other thing that was really amazing about her past is that. And and really tragic is that her parents divorced when she was three and she was made a ward of the court by the age of eight because her parents weren't able to take care of her because of of drug and alcohol issues. Oh, my goodness. Um, she actually was homeless between the ages of 13 and 14 and started to have a severe drug problem herself around the age of 14. So she's had a pretty hardcore upbringing a pretty hard wow. road, pretty hard road to the success that she has now wow and you know i just i kind of wonder if she i i saw an interview or i i uh, read an interview about how she sympathizes with alpha because she thinks um that something in her past has driven her to be this steadfast in her her you know need to survive and need to protect her child and be the leader and things like that so i i think that she probably draws upon that darkness and puts that into the character of it kind of makes you wonder doesn't it yeah yeah so she also was one of nine children holy moly yeah was her dad named Jerry? <laughs> and her mom's name was Nabila. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I thought one thing that was really cool, though, there's a quote from her on her IMDb page. And she says, my foster mother died and I didn't have a relationship with my real parents. I know who they are. It's not upsetting. It's just the way it is. You can't cannot change things. My childhood isn't like an albatross around my neck. Good for her. So wow. She seems to be pretty prosaic about the whole thing. You know, I thought I wanted to go have a drink with Jerry, but now I want to go have a drink with her. <laughs> you can have a drink with her. I still think she's a little scary. I'll go have a drink <laughs> with Jerry. Oh, but scary in the best way. <laughs> and we will get to that. It's in my ugly. So the other thing that's super interesting about her is she lives on a farm in the middle of rural England. 
She doesn't have a TV. She had never seen any of The Walking Dead before she took the part. Um, she has a movie projector. That's how she consumes media when she's at home. Okay, that's actually interesting, but not surprising. Like, oh, I can, I can see I ha- that about her. I have a surprise for you. Guess what movie she wanted to be in? What? Love Actually. <laughs> Congratulations on not being in Love oh Actually, God, Samantha. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that, and of course, I thought immediately of you. Oh, I totally ruined that for a set of friends the other day. <laughs> oh, that's so funny and awful at the same time. Oh, uh, the husband was kind of at the same mindset as me, but he, cause he, he was talking about, um, oh, the, um, what's his name? The guy who played Snape. Alan who Rickman. Peop- Alan Rickman. Mm-hmm. He was talking about his character and how it was like, it was all dirty, dirty with his secretary. And I was like, yeah, that wasn't even the worst one. I was like, uh, the one where like he didn't even have a conversation with her. He saw her in her underwear and fell in love. I was like, that's the worst love story. Ah, that's so <laughs> funny, Colin Firth's character. Oh. And he's like, I never realized that. I was like, so many people didn't. <laughs> We're terrible. <sighs> the worst okay what else about uh, samantha morton so she did say that in spite of never having seen the walking dead she had a huge passion for george romero movies (sighs) now i really love her that's awesome the other thing i will say is that that little clip of interview that i watched with her so she was in like this this runway fashion gown with her alpha hair and it was such a bizarre juxtaposition to see her like in makeup and this gown with this totally shaven head. It was amazing. I you know, I'm totally okay with that. Um It was a there, little startling. Uh one of the one of the chicks from Doctor Who uh who was in Guardians of the Galaxy she was the blue chick the bad one Oh uh-huh never Um left. yeah she shaved her head for that role and so she actually went around for a while with a shaven head and like wore ball gowns and to premieres and stuff and like it's a little weird at the beginning and then you just get used to it and now i just think of the the king's uh, guards in wakanda you know aha uh-huh. okay i can see yeah. that yeah they're i mean all... deny never has hair yeah they're all bald and beautiful and badass so yeah i'm i'm okay with it and Although I would never shave my head, there are days. Trust me. <laughs> my my hair is a, a a comforting thing to me. It's a security blanket. But man, there are days. Mine's pretty short, but it's not shaved by any stretch. I don't have the features for short hair. Mm, mm. I don't care at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I I am getting the Cruella de Vil gray streak in the front though. Oh, very cool. And I I was just touching it up the other day and I'm like, oh, this is so close to being worth to grow out. <laughs> like I, I actually want to go in and just have it just like that whole section just like bleached and grayed out so that like I don't have to have the whole grow out phase. But yeah, it would look totally cool. Gray is in, you could totally do it. That would be awesome. I'm okay, just, so, I'm oh, go ahead. Not there yet. So one last thing I wanted to say about Samantha Morton and about Alpha. She, in this interview in Entertainment Weekly, said she doesn't see Alpha as a villain. She yeah. sees her as someone with an absolute conviction, with courage, with strength, and with love. Right. Which I was like, oh, I don't see her with love. I don't see her so much with courage as psychosis. <laughs> okay, and so but I, I think was actually... that her view, her, her view of Alpha allows her to play her very convincingly and to be really committed to the character. It's the whole going back to the villain is the hero of their own piece, and she's keeping all of these people alive and safe and feeding them and protecting them, and she's except got her babies, back. <laughs> except babies, but we're all just animals. 
but yeah, I mean, I, I can see, I can see her thinking and we always talk about it, you know, at, there, but for the grace of starting out in a different group during the apocalypse, you know, we, we all think the, the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions. So I get where she's coming from. Well, she is definitely someone who sees Alpha very differently than the way I see Alpha. And again, I think that allows her to play the character really convincingly. Right. And like we said, maybe she draws on that dark childhood. Yeah. As we all do. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else about Samantha Morton? Other no. than you're going to go and get BritBox? Right. And you're going to tell us about Band of Gold? Band of Gold and Harlots. Like, Harlots is definitely top three now. I'm yeah, I'm going to have to get get Hulu and tell I'll tell tell us about Harlots and you can tell us about Band of Gold. <laughs> I'm in for a period piece. I'm <laughs> very good. I have to tell you totally off topic my five boxes of Angel Seasons arrived today but my Buffy <laughs> Seasons are not here yet so I'm not going to start Angel without at least getting the first four seasons of Buffy under my belt. So So I was thinking about you because I was watching a Buffy or an Angel episode today. Um, I got off work early and I did a bunch of stuff and then I took a hot bath and I watched Angel. The episode that I watched has Jeremy Renner in it. Oh, awesome. Young Jeremy Renner, awesome. Renner with super douchey facial hair. <laughs> I'll have to watch for it. Oh, it's in season one. Okay, I'll watch for it. That's hilarious. <laughs> back on topic back on topic so whisperers corner do you have anything for whisperers corner so did i hear it from you or did i hear it from my other half that spoiler alert enid may be leaving so you did not hear it from me but that was one of the things that i was going to bring up okay so caitlin nakon who plays enid has moved from Atlanta to L.A. So the rumor is that they're going to kill off Enid. Oh, that's just devastating. I know. I'm actually really bummed. I'm really liking the character. I'm liking the romance between her and Alden. And what are they going to do for a doctor at Hilltop? Is Sadiq dead? Sadiq is still alive, but Sadiq okay. is in Alexandria. Yeah, that's true. And I don't think there's anyone else who's training. No, no, they need to work on their apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of our new characters will step in. I don't know that any of them has any of the skill set that Enid's got. Yeah, no. Huh. So the article that I read said it doesn't necessarily mean anything that she has moved her base of operations from Atlanta to L.A., but the article also speculated that perhaps it means that Enid is not long for the show. Don't leave. I know. It's actually, that's another thing that's been kind of hard to, to stomach is just all of the losses of characters that we've had this season right. and that we're kind of coming up, up upon. So, so my other half and I Because we know we're losing Deny. Yeah. So my know. other half and I were talking and he's like, God, when Deny leaves, like, there, yeah, that's just another one that, you know, from the beginning, there's no one, there's only two people left or a couple people left in the beginning. I was like, she wasn't even with us in the beginning. Right. But the only two left are Melissa McBride and um, Daryl. I was going to say you've been binging his show. <laughs> Daryl and Daryl. I know. Norman, Norman Reedus. Reedus. And of course, it was the Norman Reedus, uh, Melissa McBride episode after this talking or walking dead. Which involved no motorcycles. I know, right? <laughs> that was but it funny. was still cool nonetheless. It was definitely cool. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, there are only two left from the beginning. That's just crazy to think about. It it kind of makes it hard. And you know, yeah. I, I one of the things that that I've been reading is that they're gonna keep it going with this kind of revolving cast the way that they've set things up now. But, and I'm totally up for that, but it just <sighs> 
it seems too rapid, you know? It's I feel pretty like- rapid, and I think, you know, you develop relationships with characters, and it's kind of hard to have the kinds of relationships that we've developed with some of those characters from the very beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, just in the past season or two, we've lost uh, Carl, Rick, and we're... Huh. Technically losing Maggie. So I loved the beginning when uh, uh, Jesus was like, Maggie wanted to be here pers- to thank you personally. Right. But and in my head, I finished his sentence with she's off the show now. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, Whiskey Cavalier premieres, premieres tomorrow night on ABC. So don't forget, set your of course. This won't be out by then. So hopefully right. people will have watched it. Well, so Forbes had an article today that said, bad news for The Walking Dead. Lauren Cohan's new show is good. Mm. So good for her, bad for The Walking Dead. Good for her, bad for us. Yep. Yep. So I definitely will be watching. I, you know, I swear no allegiance to any one network or any one show. I love most of them. So, unless it's Hulu <laughs> or BritBox, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to see. So, um, the other piece that I have for the Whisperers Corner is guess who fans are shipping? I don't know. Connie and Daryl. No, I know. I don't see it either. No, I mean, it remains to be seen with their little uh, outing that they're going on to find Henry. But but there hmm. was an article that I read yesterday that was all about fans are shipping them as a possible possible couple. And the only reason why I can't see it is because now I can't see Daryl with anybody. Daryl's just Daryl. Mm hmm. Like, I, I, at this point, I'm not shipping him with anyone ever. Like, he's just Daryl. They talked a little bit with Norman Reedus in the article, and he was basically like, you know, if Daryl falls, Daryl's going to fall hard. For somebody, it's going to be a forever kind of thing. I think my last big ship was with Beth. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a time where I thought it was going to be Aaron. After Aaron, you know, because. Yeah, I never thought that. Really? Mm-mm. When he had spaghetti with Aaron and his husband, I was like, hmm. But you never know. No, by then I just assumed he was asexual. <laughs> really? Seriously? <laughs> He's a Ken doll down there. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed that he didn't really have romantic preface, or sexual yeah. feelings for anybody. No. You know? No. Nope. Just a man and his dog. <laughs> That's right. But not in that weird way. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I've got for Whisperer's Corner. Yeah, I just, I feel like every time we have a Whisperer's Corner, it's like, hey, guess who's leaving? Right. Well, let's hope next week that's not the case. Right. Next week will be a good episode because somebody's coming on the show that I really, really love. Beta? Yeah. Uh-huh. They showed him in this episode. Mm-hmm. Yep. But they didn't he- identify him as Beta. No. Nope. He's Opie from Sons of Anarchy. Mm-hmm. I love that show. I love Opie. I've got to say, another one that was somewhere on the list but never made it to the top yeah it's it'll hold up though i think i i I don't think you need to watch it like within the next year the next five years it's like when you get around to it well i finally rewatched the premiere of supernatural and i think i'm gonna stick with it (gasps) good on you i know 12 seasons oh my god monumental undertaking i know but i've also got seven seasons of buffy and five seasons of angels so (laughs) oh man i blow through those at at a pace you can't imagine (laughs) well it's kind of nice to have them be just half an hour episodes you know 
they're like 42 minutes. Mm, the last one I watched was like a half an hour and it was really, really pretty nice. I was like, oh, I can totally take a little bite sized bite of Buffy. It's good. Hmm, maybe that's why I can blow through them so quickly. Because mm-hmm. like I can take a two hour bath. I can. I don't have kids. I can do that. Oh, I don't have kids and I can't take a two hour <laughs> bath. Oh. So, are we on to our goods, bads, and our uglies? I guess it's my turn first this time, huh? It is, because I'm afraid I'm going to steal your good. All right. So, my good is, I know you don't like flashbacks, but I did. Ooh. I did not steal your good. You didn't. So, we get to see Jesus, which was really nice. I really hope that we get to see more of him when we learn about more backstory. Yeah. And I was looking and episode 14 is called Scars. So I'm wondering if Mm -hmm. we'll see him again in that episode. I know. I was really, really bummed that like we got such a tiny bit of back the flashback in this Mm -hmm. episode that I just went and was like, what are we going to see? And I tried to read the IMDb, but it's only the next episode that has a synopsis. But yep, there is one called Scars. Yep. So we also learned that at the time of the flashback that Hilltop was fighting an illness where they needed antibiotics and IV fluids and that kind of stuff. Mm hmm. And we learned that Tara boosted extra supplies and defected from Alexandria, thus sealing her fate with Michonne. She's a fugitive. I wonder if there's a bounty on her head. (laughs) There you go. Bounty. (laughs) Um, That was when Ezekiel got the charter. And that was when Carol had her mid-length hair. Loved it. Yeah. I am all about the middle zone. Mm Mm-hmm. And it made me think of another thing, and I jotted this down in my goods, although it's probably more writing potpourri than it is a good. Have we seen anything of Oceanside since the time jump? Okay, my other half just mentioned this tonight, and I was like, well, damn it, we haven't. No, nothing. Zip, zero, zilch. I mean, I think the first mention of Oceanside was seeing their name on the charter. Yeah. And I didn't even notice that, so good on you. All of the kingdoms have places where the leaders can sign and they're all designated with the name of the, not kingdom, of the different communities. Right. And Oceanside is on the charter. That's funny that, like, I haven't seen him, haven't heard from him. I mean, nothing. I, I, there's been a lot going on, but you'd think they'd kind of be around. Everyone's sort of, I mean, I know that our trade relations are strained at least on the show if not in real life Uh, (laughs) our trade relations are strained between the communities but you'd still think they'd be trading like corn for dried fish right you know like you you, man can only live by you know not fish alone or yeah i just well and and ross marquand's character um aaron had kind of created a bond with oceanside so and he's still on the show and he's still involved actively so i'm kind of surprised that there's not still a bond between his community and oceanside yeah where is he these days he's in alexandria right Yes. yes yeah he is yeah hmm so that's my good. I love the flashback. Yeah, I was okay with it. I liked seeing Jesus. <laughs> and and mid loved... Carol. <laughs> yes. And I loved on the Talking Dead when Tara talked about riding, how hard it is to ride up on a horse and hit your mark. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um. So my good, I totally thought I was going to steal this from you. My good was um, seeing, um, now I can't remember her name. Um, Help me out here. Uh, Deaf. Connie. Connie. Seeing Connie or hearing Connie's perspective. Um, so when she went and rescued the baby, uh, and she was running through the cornfield and we've talked about this on the show before, how it must be really difficult in the zombie apocalypse to not be able to hear the threats around you. 
And so that whole scene where we get it from her perspective, even her POV, um, is just terrifying. Like, uh, target heart rate achieved for me. I was almost in tears by the time they came and rescued her. Like, I just, I I felt so terrible for her because she's, you know, she's got these visual obscurities with the corn and things keep popping out at her and she can't hear anything. And you don't know if it's a walker or if it's a whisperer. And, you know, finally it's Daryl and she's got no place to turn. And I'm sure the baby's crying and she could probably feel it or sense it, but she can't hear it. But everyone else can and they're coming for her. And it just it was it was the best sort of chaos. And it was so intense. I loved it. It was successfully scary. I agree. Yes. That was I actually just... one of my uglies. Oh, one of your uglies. That's one of awesome. my uglies. One of them. <laughs> so and it kind of got me thinking because, um, you know, I, I, I kind of. I, I don't know her backstory, so I don't know like it, what caused her deafness. And if if we were legitimately hearing what she hears or if she hears silence or, you know, anything like that, because I don't I mean, there's degrees of deafness um, and it's like angel theory is um, partially hearing impaired. She's not, you know, fully deaf or anything like that. And on the show, she doesn't wear her hearing aids, but she, she does in real life. And so I really wondered if, if Connie does kind of hear that, that almost, uh, blood pressure sound, you know, that internal, you know, whoosh and like all the obscure sounds around her that she can't quite pinpoint. And it was just, it was so intense. And I loved seeing her perspective finally or hearing her perspective. And it just confirmed that that would be absolutely terrifying in the zombie apocalypse to not be able to hear. It I really, mean, if you, and it was old fashioned horror. It really yes. was. Yes, Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, I, I'm not big on kids, but man, I'm so glad she rescued that baby. Like, <laughs> like every everyone's acting in that scene, like up into uh, where Connie rescued the baby, like e like everyone's build toward the panic, you know, of these walkers are coming for this crying child and mm -hmm. nobody's doing anything. It just it just. Yeah, it was it was a very nice crescendo. Oh, and I've got to tell you, and this is in my writing potpourri too, but this seems like an appropriate place to say it. I love that Luke knew where she was and was signing to her behind his back. Yes, that I'm was like, so cool. I need to learn sign language stat. Like that, just who else was the perfect person to be in the cornfield and then to have Luke be one of the captive ca you know one of the captives that mm -hmm. you know they could communicate without saying anything and with his hands tied tied behind his back that was just that was the best it was very cool yeah. i liked was, it was that out of the comic books no oh, excellent writing i agree so what was your bad so my bad actually kind of is related to your good. <laughs> so it actually bothered me that they felt some need for sound during Connie's dash through the cornfield. I felt like they could have had it be entirely silent and that would have been just as suspenseful and just as scary and perhaps might have represented her point of view even better. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, one of, I always go back to Buffy. I think I've said this before. One of my favorite episodes of Buffy is an episode, um, and it's not Hush. It's not the ones where they took everyone's voice away, which is a great episode. But um, it's one where a very important character dies, and there's just this shock on the show. They have no background music in the show at all. Like the entire time, you know how you have like during sappy scenes, you'll have, you know, romantic violin music or intense scenes. You'll have, you know, you'll have something to get your blood pumping. They have nothing. It's just this silent mm -hmm. shock. And it's so jarring to not to witness all of that, and not have any sound. And I agree. It, it totally adds to the intensity. Yeah, they could have completely played with that during the cornfield scene. Okay, now I'm going to go back 
and watch it and mute it. <laughs> That's a good idea. And I guess it was sorghum, not corn. But I don't know the difference. I mean, I don't know how sorghum grows. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, it looked like corn to me. It but... looked like corn to me, too. And they, uh, Connie also made the reference on her interview on Talking Dead that uh, it was like Children of the Corn. Right. And I thought the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so another thing that I had that was a very, very small bad, but when it first, when the, when they first opened up on Alpha's face, mm -hmm. her makeup was not as dark around her eyes and her mouth as it was at the end of last episode and as it was later into this episode. So I was like, a mm, little bit of a continuity error there. Yeah. Continuity error. Mm hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So that was picky. That was very nitpicky, but that was my other bad. What well, did, what did you have as a bad? My bad is kind of the same old bad. So in the theater, we go in and there's all these zombies that are hi behind a barricade. Why aren't we stabbing them in the head? Like, Instead you of can, waiting for them to like right. break through. You can reach them. Just like stab the first row when it creates a better barricade for the ones behind. And so, okay, you don't do it when you first go in because it's unnecessary or whatever. I don't know. But then when they were starting to kind of break free, uh, when Diane and Jerry came down mm -hmm. and they were like, well, do we go get the bulb or don't we? And yes, we do. And like they were all like standing there, like bracing and like like just holding off like like these were human beings or like sentient animals or something that they didn't want to stab. Like, I just don't understand their hesitation. You know, just just start stabbing them when, in the head. Like, I, I don't get it. So we're 10 years into the zombie apocalypse. You see a zombie, you kill a zombie. Like, that's just how it goes. I just think it was kind of a, if we don't have to expend the energy, we don't need, we don't want to expend the energy. And it, it didn't become something that was necessary until the, until Diane and Jerry came down and said that they had lost the bulb into that area. It's never necessary until the zombies build up on the fence and knock the fence over. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they always do they always do and i get it it's it's part of the the plot hole you know it's i, I but it's still it's not a documentary it's not a documentary it's not a documentary <laughs> But yeah, so that was that was really my bad. And it's a nitpicky bad, but I'm still like 10 years into the zombie apocalypse. If you see a zombie and you can kill it, like I get that they led all of the ones out of the theater with the boom box, which, which I love. By, by the, the way, way, where did they get the batteries for the boom box? Well, that's why it died so quickly. Oh, OK. Yeah. I mean, it, like it died in, like, in? under 10. Uh, well, Maybe they have rechargeable batteries or okay, maybe that's you, fair. That's fair. Maybe, maybe Eugene rigged it up somehow to be solar and the sun, sh you know, it shifted into the shade or something. <laughs> All right. I'm willing to entertain both of those theories. <laughs> I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and entertain both of those theories. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we still have gas that fires and we're making our own ethanol. So, and we have zombies, you know, we suspend disbelief for that. That's true. But, yeah, I loved the everyone was kind of rocking out mm -hmm. to the yeah, that that was pretty funny. But yeah, I just I I get that, you know, we lead large herds away, but if you're in a small space and they're kind of building up against the barricade, just, you know, stab those first 3 in the head and, you know, make it a little more difficult for the ones behind. Okay, so I have to <laughs> ask you what would be on your mission mix? <sighs> Right now, I am super into the band The Pretty Reckless. Um, so Taylor Momsen is their lead singer. And if you ever watched uh, the, the Grinch Soul Christmas, the, the live action one with Jim Carrey. Right. She was the little girl who. Oh, really? And she's That's a total. really cool. She's a total badass rocker chick now. And I am, I'm listening to their albums on repeat. And it's probably just because like, I'm like rage working at work. That is so cool. 
Yeah. So the pretty reckless uh, would probably be featured prominently on my my mix. What would be on yours? It would have to be some female empowerment thing, like a Katy Perry song. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You'll have to listen to some Pretty Reckless. I'll have to do that. I'll have to put yeah. them on my Apple Music. Yeah. Careful you don't speed. They're very easy to, to speed. <laughs> Especially in your little sports car, your zippy charger. Yeah. I'm not driving her right now. Her brights are out and husband has to fix her. So I'm driving the big truck right now. Oh, yeah. So are we. The roads are crap. No little cars in the winter. Well, as soon as I get my my brights back, but it's pretty hard when it's still dark early in the day and there are moose that's going true. across the road. Yeah, that's terrifying. It is a little Ooh. terrifying. All right, which album should I put on my iTunes? Uh, I'm going to have to find it now. So who are you selling for? Going to Hell or Light Me Up? Um... Going to Hell is really good. Okay. All right, I added it to my library, and she does not look like little little girl who anymore. <laughs> no. No. Okay, That's anybody funny. who's listening, what would be on your mission mix? Share yes. it on our Biters page. This will be interesting. We might find some new music. Yeah. So, my ugly... I have yes. multiple things in my ugly. And we touched on one of them. We touched on one of them, so I won't go back to that. But I really liked seeing the preparations for the fair. And I liked the juxtaposition of the bulb mission, which was totally frivolous, with Connie's run through the cornfield. Because they mm. really showed, like, the battling the walkers kind of interposed between those two scenes. Right. So I thought that was really cool. I, right. I at first I was not sold on the theater thing at all, but I really warmed to it and I really enjoyed it. So, do you think the bulb mission was frivolous? Uh, you know, I felt like it had a certain degree of frivolity to it, but there was a comment that Kari Payton said about it in I don't know if he said it on the Talking Dead or if it was on an uh, an interview that I watched, but he said this is about th not just surviving but about thriving. <laughs> Okay, and so Enid also had the same sort of thing. She talked about her letter from Carl. Right, which was a good callback. That it wasn't enough to just survive. Mm -hmm. You have to live. And so I, those two things for me clicked. They tied together um, in that, yes, you could see that putting all of these mothers and fathers and important people's lives at risk for something as frivolous as movie night, but... You know, at some point you have to stop just surviving and you have to live. And that was Kari Payton's point about the whole mission. So I thought that was really cool. I got really bought into the mission, actually. Right. And then you have that juxtaposed against the Whispers who just survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we got a little glimpse of, of how they live and uh, apparently, you know, they're hooking up, too. So it's not too hard to be a whisperer, but you're eating worms. One just, meaning of bounty versus the other meaning of bounty. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you do what you got to do to survive. But eventually, most of us have to live. And, you know, I think Lydia finally saw that that living was possible. Mm -hmm. she, she didn't have to be dead anymore. So the other thing that I have to say about my ugly is that Alpha has a level of psychosis that I think goes even beyond Negan. I mean, I thought someone who could just casually beat two people's heads in with a baseball bat was pretty psycho. But the way that Alpha just abandoned that baby to the walkers, we're animals. Well, animals have babies. Samantha Morton actually touched on a similar thread in an interview before this episode. And it was about um, Alpha uh, killing the guy in the, the safe house mm -hmm. in Baltimore. Um, and that 
people were they were shocked that she had no like even even serial killers who talk about the first time they killed somebody it's it's a very traumatic and jarring event for them you know in, in one way or another either it like sparks something in them or you know it, like people you know who killed somebody they deeply regret it and they go through you know a, a big remorse and they they have a lot of issues afterwards she was just kind of like hmm he's dead you know like people were like she was very cold about it so there are some deep mental issues mm-hmm. there with her going back to before the the apocalypse a thing that i really like about it though is that her level of psychosis allows her to find a place that discovers our group's weaknesses yeah like she pretty quickly with that baby found a weak spot in our group yeah, um, Norman Reedus touched on that in his interview uh, on the Talking Dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. And it, it, like I said, it is so unsettling that she is so calm and so slow and it just resolved mm-hmm. to, you know, leave a baby in a field or, you know, just murder these two guys because you won't give me my kid back. Like, I just with she's so casual about it it's just it's alarming mm-hmm. yeah so, so that we, actually, oh go ahead that actually plays into my ugly so my ugly is ugly so all of the villains that we have had previously um what's his name from terminus gareth gareth negan the governor and even the wolves, even though they hadn't showered, they were still not just ugly, you know, mm-hmm. like they, they have done a really good job of just, you know, these are people that don't care about appearances or or anything. And it's just somebody who's at that level. I I just I can't imagine uh, after everything that we have seen, you know, Negan bashing people's heads in with baseball bats and the governor chopping off um, heads and, and just everything that we've seen that we can still run into something that is the stuff of nightmares, you know, and it, like the makeup department has done so well with not only the the walkers uh, suits, but with Alpha's makeup herself, like she looks very alien to me. She like, does. Every, yeah, I mean, she just she almost doesn't even look human. It's just it's crazy. I love it. It's a good ugly. My ugly's ugly, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you got in rotting potpourri? Mm, so. Where are we getting gum? <laughs> <laughs> my rating was wads of gum, but seriously, my first thought was like, where is he getting that much gum? Like, I don't know, but he was making a big deal out of finding as much gum as he could possibly stuff in his mouth. Right? And I love that he got it on Ze- Ezekiel. That was super funny. Mm-hmm. It just every scene that Jerry was in was funny. It was great. I loved it. I didn't have a whole lot in writing potpourri, do you? Oh, let's see. What do I have? Um... One of the things that I had was, um, so when Alpha was at the gate and she yelled up, uh, which one of you leads these people? And Daryl looks around at everyone. Of course, nobody knows what to answer because, of course, Jesus was just killed. And he's like, what the hell does it matter? I, I thought that was actually a really smart move. Like, cause you know, your initial, your initial thought is to be like, Oh, I do. Or, Oh, she does, you know, like, but to give away your leader, I'm like, hmm, no, that's a really bad plan. Cause huh. I'm not in that situation. I didn't think about that. Yeah. I mean, granted it's because they don't have a true leader right now, but I'm like, note to self, whenever somebody menacing comes up and says who leads you i'm like mm, not gonna tell you <laughs> i'm gonna let you guess 
So because I overdid it and overachieved with Phil's Comic Corner, Phil's Comic Corner, at the <laughs> last episode that we did, I don't really have anything for this Comic Corner. But I will say that Alpha's There Will Be No Conflict speech is right out of the comic books. Ooh. This is a good speech. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I was a little, I'm, it was almost my bad. I'm so annoyed with Henry and I have to remember he's a teenage boy. Like, you know, a teenage boy in the zombie apocalypse who doesn't have anything better to do than be annoying. Uh, I love that on Talking Dead, they touched on that, like, Kid hasn't done, you know, made one horseshoe. Like, what happened to his apprenticeship? Um, but I just, I don't know. I feel like he he's like season two Carl. He's just causing trouble everywhere, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Poor and, Carl. Yeah, well, season two Carl. And, I, you know, he's he's kind of taking the role of of what Carl did in the books um, with the way that they're driving his character right mm -hmm. now. Oh, yeah. But, he's totally taking Carl's role in, in Hilltop yeah. right now. Yeah. But I'm just like, I just hate like how dumb teenage boys can be, I guess. Like and they were talking about it, how, you know, they were he was so struck with Alpha. And I go back to my with love Lydia, action. you mean? Uh, yeah, uh, my my love. Yeah, Alpha's daughter. Uh, I go back to my love actually roots in that this is a really bad love story. The only reason why he likes her is because she's attractive and age appropriate. I was going like, to say she's the only girl other than was it Abby or Addie who's age appropriate. Right. And I kind of feel like Addie blew him off. She was just like, mm, no, call me in a few years. When you grow up. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I just, I don't, and I, I don't know. I just, I'm irritated with Henry and I feel like that's not going to get helped next episode, except he does, he does take down a, um, whisperer with some ease. So that was pretty impressive, but I just, teenage boys and don't at me because I'm talking about boys, not men. If you think this applies to you, you're a boy, not a man. So it doesn't <laughs> apply to you. I just get annoyed with teenage boys, which is why one of the reasons why I don't have kids. Well, so speaking of teenagers and speaking of teenagers who've been gaslit their entire lives, I liked Lydia's little speech to Henry when she said she wasn't supposed to come. She broke her own rules. Maybe she misses me. Maybe she's sorry. Because it just showed how brainwashed she still is. You can call me mom. Or you can call me alpha like the rest of mm -hmm. them. Oh, That was horrible. Oh, that's just heartbreaking. I did kind of like seeing um, Lydia in her uh, skinny jeans and her bright magenta top. You know, it was... I'm sure she's never been clean or you know like you're since right she probably hasn't been that clean since being in that that shelter shelter on day 23 yeah ew yeah she, I, or, or anything bright because if you look at all of the whispers they wear dark colors mm -hmm. and so here she is in this bright magenta top you know that's she can be spotted from a mile away. I know that's like the somebody's gonna have to give her their hoodie or something. Like if she rejoins the the whispers group, because that's just a target on your back. Well, I mean, we he, see that at next episode she has rejoined the whispers group. So. Yeah, yeah. So I just I did kind of like seeing her, you know, put on clean clothes and and be a teenage girl, and for even if it was just for a few minutes, so. But I just it was very the the color. I, it had to be a very uh, um, uh, pointed pick of of the color of top. And for those of you out there who don't know magenta, just Google Google it. It's a very bright, vivid pink, like dark pink. Um, 
And it's, I mean, you might as well wear, you know, sunshine yellow or, or fire engine red or something. It's just, you stand out. And she stood out from the whispers. It was definitely, you know, nothing she had ever experienced before. So I just thought that was interesting. Do you think Henry picked out her clothes? Or do you think someone, it was just random? I think he picked out her clothes, but were they just at the little clubhouse or did he grab them off a clothesline before? I think he grabbed them before because Daryl said to get help her get cleaned up and get her some clothes, didn't he? Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I just want to know how he knew her size in skinny jeans. I don't even know my own size <laughs> skinny jeans. They only have skinny jeans in the apocalypse. They do. I lo- So Norman Reedus pointed out. Right, unless couple- you're Daryl. Yeah. yeah, unless you're Daryl. Yeah. I love that. That's funny. So another thing I have for you, what's the spray paint on the sign as Ezekiel and Carol are leaving the town? Okay. Do you not know? And are you just quizzing me? Or yes, do you I legitimately seriously don't know. know. Do you know? I think I know. So Alpha in Alpha's speech, she talked about um, this is their territory and so you invaded our territory. That was what I read was that someone said it's a, it's a territorial marker for the whispers. Yep. I think that's Alpha's mark. Yep. But And I'm like, how can this be your territory? We've been here for 10 years. Get your own territory. Get off, <laughs> get off my corner. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the whispers are, are a very territorial lot. That is one of the things that you learn in their arc in the comic book. So That's what I hear. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I have to say also in my writing potpourri, one of the things that I really loved was that the way that with the exception of Henry and Daryl, this episode ended in a really hopeful way. It showed, it showed Enid and Alden tumbling into bed together. It showed Tammy and Earl ha- holding the baby and cooing with the baby. Yeah. And it was really a hopeful and really happy end to the episode. I'm such a negative Nancy. Like when I saw Enid and Alden, I was like, "Ooh, he's been festering in a walker oh, skin. I hope, I hope he showers. He probably cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just, you know, in still nine seasons in, it's so hard to find light moments in this series that it was nice to have some hope. Yeah, I really liked that they gave Tammy and Earl the baby. Mm-hmm. Like, I, for some reason, I figured it would just, like, Tara or Enid or somebody would step up. But, it, I mean, they lost their son. And so now, you know, and they've been so bitter about it. So now they have new hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, I also liked the uh, accuracy of Jerry's understanding about uh, projector bulbs. <laughs> so that is very true to life my very first job was in a movie theater and it was in a movie theater that had actual fil- film reels and those bulbs are very very delicate and if you touch them the oils from your fingers can make them explode so I just loved that they were completely accurate about that I love that they still had bubble wrap and duct tape this far in you know, I don't think many people were raiding Office Max. That's true. Yeah. I, I feel like that was probably skipped when we were looting. <laughs> yeah. You got anything else? No, I think we've got some feedback. And then I Excellent. think it's a wrap. I love feedback. So we had feedback from Diane LaSorsa, and you were right. Nadia Hilker's tattoos are not real. Which I don't like being right about that because I love her tattoos. I know, but Diane LaSorsa said she met her at a Walker Stalker and she did not have any tattoos. 
I love that it was asked on the Talking Dead, and she was like, nope, they're like, so we weren't the only ones who were like, no, they're totally real. And I was still totally convinced she was being snarky on the Talking Dead <laughs> and that it wasn't true. But Diane LaSorsa confirmed that you, in fact, are right. She does not have any tattoos, at least none that are big, visible ones like the ones that we see in her character Magna. I was going to say, I think the little delicate one around her left wrist is her, legit. I don't know, Diane, did you notice? You'll have to let us know. <laughs> so, what else do you got? Um, we also had feedback from Victoria Morris, who said, so we know the real reason for Carol's long hair. It's so we can work out what's a flashback and what's not. <laughs> I, I love that. And then she said, I really enjoyed this episode. Connie is fast becoming my new favorite character. Love her teaming up with Daryl, even if he doesn't want her to. I also really appreciated the way they demonstrated in one fell swoop the challenges of being deaf in the zombie apocalypse as Connie took the baby through the maze and the advantages in situations such as her silent communication with Luke. Brilliant. That's why it was my good. Mm -hmm. loved, loved it. So it, it really makes me want to learn sign language. I knew, used to know how to um, do the alphabet in sign and that's all, you know, and I, it makes me think of, um, I was at a local coffee shop and it's, I, I don't usually go to it in the summertime because it's like right on our main street. And so it's when we have like, and I'm not even kidding, when we have like 30,000 tourists in town, it like we double our population sometimes um, in Juneau because uh, the cruise ships dock right downtown and I work downtown. So in the wintertime, I walk down to the coffee shop and in the summertime, I go to one like up the street. Um, there was somebody who was um, sign doing sign language. They were deaf or mute and they were trying to communicate their order to the person at the coffee stand. And they, um, I think they were trying to write it at some point, but actually somebody came out to the, from the back and started communicating, um, with ASL. And I was just like, Oh, I want to be that person. Like I just, that, that was just so awesome to me that somebody was able to step in and, and be that translator. So, well, it's never too late. I know we have a, an independent living place that actually teaches sign language. I need to look into classes. Cool. Um, so let's see other feedback. We've got a couple of posts from Thomas O'Mara from his Walker Stalker cruise, which was the last Walker Stalker cruise. So check those out on our Facebook page. Mm. Um, and then we had, we actually had a letter. So we had an email letter from Jamil. I don't know if, if Jamil wants us to say um, his whole name, so I'm going to just leave, just say Jamil. I hope I'm saying it right. It says, hello, ladies. I have a theory about the X scars that Michonne and Daryl share. Back in season 9A, when Michonne was sneaking out at night and killing walkers, we saw that she came across a man hung in a tree. I wonder if whoever did this to the man may have caught Michonne and in the end, be being that Daryl was living outside of the community, was able to save her, um, but not before them both being branded with these X's. Norman, mm. Norman Reedus on The Talking Dead said it was dark and it was only between them. I feel they may have been racist survivors on... I feel they may have been racist survivors who made... Uh, one made those scars or who made those scars. Anyway, not sure if anyone else had this theory. Let me know your thoughts on this. I like the theory. Yeah. I don't have I, any good theories about where they came from. And it makes sense that it would be a time when Michonne is away from the rest of the community. Right. Because here I'm thinking that the, that's the reason why they don't want to let Magna's group into the community is they had somebody come in and, you know, they they had to fight them off. And th these are battle scars. But no, it's shared just between Daryl and Michonne. So that is a really good theory that they were caught outside the gates and had to go through something terrible, just the two of them. Oh, and then to the the hanging walker, I mm -hmm. wouldn't even have put wouldn't even put that together. That's awesome. Good theory, Jamil. 
And if I said your name wrong, please write me back and let me know so I can correct it in Corrections Corner. (laughs) (laughs) And keep giving us feedback because you know I love the attention. Yes. So you can reach us at southgatemediagroup at gmail.com. You can message us on our Facebook page, either private message us or put a public post on the Facebook page. You can like us and rate us on iTunes. And all of this helps us out to spread to more listeners. So that would be great. Which we love love, because we're attention whores. Yep. (laughs) And we love that you love our particular brand of weirdness. Yes. And don't forget to tell us what your mission mix is. Mission mix. Yep. Awesome. Well, with that, I think that's the conclusion of Bounty. Yeah, I think that's about all I've got. Yeah. So I'm going to let you lead us off this time. So I have to take you aside and tell you that um, there must be like just a millisecond delay in my hearing versus what we say. Because when I think that we are spot on... I hear that we are totally off. Like when, when you go back and listen to the episode. So you must have like less of a delay. Cause you, you always call it. You're like, we were totally off on that one. And I think that we're spot on. So it's my delay people. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the slow sister, but the funnier one. That's what I always tell people. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I mean, <laughs> I'd laugh at me. Oh, that's awful. I laugh at me all the time. (laughs) I love you. (laughs) I love you too. And we love the listeners. Yes, we do. So just remember, take take it it one one dead dead day day at at a time. time. I think we nailed it. Really? So I felt like I was too fast. No, I think it was pretty good. Awesome. Have a good week, everybody. All right, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.